Right, pick it up. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone in attendance, wherever you may be in the world. I know I'm in Washington, D.C., where it's a beautiful day, but our panelists today, Jagjit uh, Lali and Hassan Karar, are in different parts of the world. Um, so I think we have it really covered today. Um, I'm Ben Hopkins, the director of the Seeger Center for Asian Studies at the George Washington University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all today to uh, our monthly installment of New Books in Asian Studies. And we have an absolute cracker for us today uh, from a colleague of mine at uh, University College London, Jagjit Lali's uh, newly released book, uh, India and the Silk Roads. It is an absolutely magisterial work. Um, it's not my job to really discuss it here because that is what uh, Dr. Carrara is going to do. But if I can just give a couple of words of praise to the book, um, this is definitely a work uh, that the first time I read it struck me as being written by a much older, and I don't mean that in terms of years, but much more mature scholar, uh, which I think just really speaks to the intellectual ambition and sophistication of the author of the work, Jagjit Lali. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic work, and as I'll point out uh, later in our session, we do have a discount code uh, that will make it all that much more important for all you guys to get it. But before we get into today's uh, discussion, just a couple of quick ground rule reminders. Um, this session is being recorded, uh, and we are looking forward to a very lively discussion with the author. Um, in order to facilitate that, I encourage you to put any questions, comments, or issues you have into the Q&A box, which is on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Uh, once we get through the presentation, we'll integrate those questions into our discussion. Um, my request is that you put uh, some identification in your question, just so we know where you're coming from and such. That would be most appreciated. Uh, the other thing that is a reminder is, in keeping with our tradition at the Seeger Center, uh, we will be giving away a copy of the book to one lucky participant. Um, so please uh, tweet us out, ask your questions, uh, put us on Facebook, um, and that automatically enters you into today's draw. Turning our attention to today's event and our participants, um, the author of this fantastic work, as I said, is Dr. Lally, who is presently a lecturer at University College London. Jagjit did his PhD at Cambridge a few years behind me and has taught at uh, Cambridge as well as Imperial College London before he ended at UCL. He has a number, indeed a, a very full CV of publications um, that range from the absolute top tiers of the uh, of the journal world, including uh, modern Asian studies and such, uh, to uh, uh, some more specialized works, and uh, is really a prodigious and prolific writer. He's also the co-director, i got to just look at my notes really quick to make sure I, I've got it right, uh, for the Center for the Study of South Asia and the Indian Ocean World. Um, our discussant today is uh, Dr. Hassan Karar, who's an associate professor at the Lahore uh, uh, um, University of Management Sciences, better known as LUMS in Pakistan, um, and he's in the Humanities and Social Sciences program. Uh, Hassan's interests include uh, China, Central Asia, and the Karakoram Mountain region of Northern Pakistan, and he's written a number of pieces on the contemporary uh, events and situation in that region, including work that has appeared in the New Silk Road Diplomacy, China's Central Asian Foreign Policy since the Cold War from University of um, British Columbia Press in 2010. Uh, I think I'll stop talking at this point and just say that I myself is, am extremely excited for this discussion. Uh, I know we're in for an absolutely rollicking uh, uh, um, conversation about India and the Silk Road's past, present, and future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jagjit that uh, um, really the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Ben, for that most generous of introductions. Um, 
uh, and for the invitation to to speak about my book, uh, which has just come out. And uh, do go out and buy it. Do use the discount code. And I uh, very much hope that someone very deserving um, wins the prize draw. What a wonderful idea for a book launch. I must uh, do that myself back at UCL. Um, thanks also to Rebecca and Miriam for setting up the event, and of course to Hassan for agreeing to discuss the book. And I um, am really, really glad that Hassan is uh, uh, my discussant today because I really wanted to open up the book. I feel like the book says everything I know and could possibly say about the topic on, at hand, and I really want to start a conversation about the book, see how other people uh, interpret it, how it speaks to their particular disciplinary fields, their particular research questions, um, and to uh, think of it as a launch pad to a conversation. And I'm so glad that Hassan, um, who is the most capable uh, person to, to do that, uh, agreed to be my discussant. And I look forward to his comments. I thought I should open this conversation with the very briefest of remarks about the scope and content of the book, just to set it out for those people who um, may not have had a chance to read it, which I imagine is most people. This, the, the book project started life as an attempt to explain whether, why, and how caravan trade between North India, Afghanistan, and the Central Asian Oasis states survived in the period of the supposed decline of the Mughal Empire and the ascendance of British power in South Asia. We know, or and I certainly knew at the start of this project, um, given what scholarship existed, that caravan trade tilted from an east-west or China-Europe axis to a more north-south axis at the dawn of the early modern period, so around about 1500, around about the time of the Renaissance. We also know that this was connected in part to Mughal rule over India, not least because of the dynasty's origins within Central Asia and the recruitment of various uh, specialists, military specialists, artists, and so on, from the Persianate world, from Iran, Central Asia, and other places but also because of the arrival of the Europeans in the Indian Ocean world, who brought with the bullion that largely flowed into the Indian subcontinent and from there lubricated trade with other places, including places um, overseas, but also overland. So the question is really then what happened when Mughal power retreats, when conflict erupted over political authority in South Asia, when new rulers emerged to take their place, and when India was incorporated within the new global economy dominated by Britain, which was becoming an industrial nation. And this is the, 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 the set of questions, uh, the point of departure that I wanted to, uh, where I situated my work. And as I sought to examine these questions, another set of issues uh, became apparent. The first, and here I really borrow from Jos Gommens, is the role of environmental difference in shaping patterns of specialization and trade. The very different ecologies of South and Central Asia between what can be called the wet and the dry zones dictated the different things that could be grown, reared, produced, or manufactured in these different places. These enduring but not immutable, and I do show the way that these uh, that environmental differences change, these, envir these, these enduring environmental differences and the patterns of economic uh, specialization that resulted from them uh, provided the basic logic for exchange. This is something I foreground very early on in the book to give a sort of structure or skeleton to the analysis that follows. A second issue was that the network of so-called caravan trade, as I call it, that I focus on was not only interleaved with other networks, but was itself a multiplicity. So for example, Indo-Central Asian trade, which is the primary focus of the book, was knitted into trade with Iran and Russia, trade networks across the Kazakh steppe and Siberia, those across the Pamirs into China and into the Indian Ocean. Larger circuits were themselves composed of smaller itineraries, if not smaller circuits, and depended on those peddlers who took goods deep into the surrounding country around important marts and cities. Afghan pastoralists and their flocks not only provided the animal power that moved the caravans, but could also be hired in India, uh, for instance, as mercenaries, and their war animals uh, were pivotal to the success in the campaign season that coincided, the winter campaign season, which coincided with the arrivals of the caravans in North India. At stake, therefore, was the deep and broad embeddedness of what 
we can call caravan trade within the political and economic life of the space under examination, what I call the trading world, to borrow from Braudel and, uh, and uh, those who've interpreted Braudel in terms like Chowdhury for the Indian Ocean world. At the same time, I realized that caravan trade provided a lens through which to write the history of this under-researched and under-historicized space and reflexively looking into archival records or even the merest traces from across these spaces could help build a picture of India's connections with Central Asia. I try to bring these issues to attention in the first three chapters of the book on the environment, on how exchange actually took place and on the relationship of trade to the production of hard power and political authority, developing them then in later chapters of the book that then look at a later period, the colonial period. And upon turning to source materials, I also realized there was a need to be creative, to look not only at the movement of people and the records of the goods they sold, but at goods or things themselves, at material traces and also at material culture, and to venture out of the archive and into museums. And doing so, I hope um, and feel, uh, very much enriched this study, for it showed how interconnected and integrated this space was, not only in commercial terms, but in cultural terms. Something I try to show in chapter five on material culture and in some of the concluding chapters of the book that return to questions of materiality, of cultural, uh, uh, of material culture and of consumption. Before I hand over to Hassan to draw out some of the themes in the book that he found most interesting, I should say a little about some of the book's main arguments, those that give it shape or purpose. The first is that trade survived through the, the post-Mughal period and the colonial transition, but it did not survive unchanged. Rather, in response to such factors as changing political patronage or economic opportunities, the geography of trade, the involvement and identities of mercantile actors, the nature and volume and value of goods carried, the relationship between mobility and information flows and state authority, all of these were repeatedly changed too. One major change came in the mid 18th century and was connected to the rise of Afghan power. Another came in the late 19th century and was connected to the expansion of British and Russian power in Asia. The second point to make is that caravan trade, as I examine it in this book, all of these constant reconfigurations notwithstanding, largely declined around the turn of the century and up to the Bolshevik Revolution. But as I argue in the book, a couple of points, that, that, that conclusion needs some qualification um, and certain issues merit attention. One point is that Russian agency was much more critical to this change than British agency. And one of my arguments is that we need to think critically about the ease with which we allied British and India during um, the, the period that we call the Raj, and instead a need to think trans-imperially, um, to think not to, not to simply allied Britain and India, to think of British India, but to think of the impact that an empire like Russia might have. Um, and other scholars, of course, looked at uh, the influx of German and American manufacturers in the Second Industrial Revolution, which very much outcompete British manufacturers, for example. And, and this, this, my work tries to do something similar to try and um, uh, uh, correct for that slippage, that elision. Another point is that trade, the, the decline of trade, wasn't uh, absolute, terminal, um, uh, and so on. What I argue in the conclusion uh, of the book by connecting with the work of Magnus Marsden and Aaron O'Connor, for example, is that in the Soviet period, we see a new set of commercial and cultural links between Pakistan and Afghanistan and Central Asian states, and Central, the Central Asian Soviets and, and the later republics. It helps, I argue, to think with the idea of the Silk Roads to help us envision these many successive sedimented or layered itineraries and exchanges which build on, them, on one another. And, and, Aaron O'Connor has very much um, showed this, that the memory of older exchanges, itineraries, movements, forms of cultural consumption can resurface, uh, be reconfigured. Um, and the decline that I talk about in the book, towards the end of the book, uh, of caravan trade in the early 20th century isn't um, absolute. And we see a return of some of these kinds of itineraries, some of these 
forms of belonging, linguistic exchange, cultural exchange, material culture, and so on. And with that, I think I should hand over to Hassan. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jagjit. Uh, just sort of, you know, want to begin by saying how uh, sort of extremely grateful and honored I am that uh, you asked me to discuss this book. It's uh, sort of extremely vast uh, sort of in scope. Uh, it's really a sort of a magnificent history, uh, which touches upon a number of very, very important aspects of Asian history. Um, my thanks also to Ben, to Maryam, to Rebecca for 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 arranging this. But but uh, sort of let me let me get straight into my comments at this point. Uh, in India and the Silk Roads, Jagjit Lali offers a detailed account of India's connections with Afghanistan and Central Asia from the 18th century through the early 20th century. These connections that linked India northwards along a web of pathways enabled not just the movement of merchants, money, and goods but also the circulation of mercenaries, pastoralists and horses, Sufis, Tarikas, itinerant physicians, and various other mobile women and men. In this process, as Lali shows, news and information also traveled, material culture was transformed. Much of the narrative in this book is centered on Western Punjab that is now in Pakistan. That being said, as Lali reminds us, the administrative boundaries are not static. Centers in Western Punjab, amongst them Multan, Dera Ghazi Khan, Shikarpur, were linked to Central Asian commercial centers such as Bukhara, Khiva, and Khokand. From here, trade fanned out to the fringes of the Russian Empire. Today, in the 21st century, when it is all but taken for granted that all Silk Roads, past, present, and future, lead to China, India and the Silk Roads is both a refreshing reorientation of a popular framing, besides being a nuanced account of the global economy in one part of Asia. This ambitious volume is a welcome contribution to the body of knowledge. It speaks to Asian history, the history of Eurasian trade, as well as scholarship on Afghanistan, Central Asia, and South Asia. Specifically, as I was reading India and the Silk Roads, I found myself thinking back to Scott Levy and Claude Markovitz on Indian traders in Central Asia, Fernand Braudel, Janet Abu Lughad, Rajat Kanta Ray on information, credit, and money in Asian trading networks, Janet Rizvi on trans karakuram trade, and Ritu Birla's work on non-Western capitalism at the turn of the 20th century. This is luminous country. This is luminous company, which is to say that India and the Silk Roads should find wide readership amongst scholars of modern Asian history. India and the Silk Roads makes use of multiple archives in the UK, India, and Pakistan. This is a book which is extremely rich in detail. I now want to highlight two particularly thought-provoking contributions of this book. These are, I think, contributions which would be of interest to scholars of Asia at large. Here I should point out, perhaps confess, that I am neither a specialist of South Asia, nor do I have research on the 18th and the 19th century. While I am interested in many of the same questions as Lali, my own work is contemporary and focused on connectivity between China and Central Asia, and China and North Pakistan. The first contribution of this book I want to underscore is that it places the caravan, the kafila, at the center of the story. Doing so immediately expands the Silk Road framing beyond bazaars and traders, networks and diasporas. Instead of assuming that mobility is self-explanatory, Lali asks, how things move? What forms did this mobility take? If I can use a contemporary term, these are questions about grassroots logistics, which I have always found fascinating when I speak with traders. How exactly does one get goods from point A to point B? Can one lash extra merchandise on the roof of a bus? Who will provide the cord? How much does a shipping company charge? Is there a choice of routes? Do the fees include clearance charges? This is the mundane yet critical aspect of long distance trade performed countless number of times daily then and now. India and the Silk Road captures the complexity of caravan logistics. Caravans had to negotiate arid and mountainous terrain, change in season, the need for pasture and labor diversions when demand for agriculture mounted. 
Caravans also had to adjust their schedules to synchronize with other caravans along the way. The caravan, in other words, could not be disassociated from ecology or how the physical environment shaped people's lives and livelihoods. Simultaneously, caravans should also not be dissociated from political economy. As Lali observes, there was a market for violence in the early modern world. For caravans, this took different forms, piracy and banditry, mercenaries offer protection, and local elite offering patronage. Yet more broadly, it was the caravan that enabled regional connectivity, or what Lali describes as interlooped circuits of mobility of different scales. Caravans were terrestrial fleets that made other forms of mobility possible. Caravans interlocked with other trans-Eurasian networks extending into Iran, the steppe, China. This was a multi-ethnic world, as Lali shows, and a religiously complex one. Inter-Asian connectivity was because of the caravan. There is yet a larger argument here, which segues into the second big contribution of this book for Asianists, that when we get to the 19th century, the different circuits of commodity and capital begin to coalesce. Let me summarize how I understand this process, and Jagjit can correct me if I'm wrong. The book suggests that long distance exchange through continental interiors had been the norm up until this point in time. It wasn't the exception. Consequently, it may be that the maritime revolution since the 16th century was the aberration. Hence, there were two types of globalized operations at the end of the 18th century. On the one hand, India's coastal regions were integrated within a global economy. On the other hand, Punjab and the Indo-Central Asian trading region, Lali suggests, remained vestiges of an older Indo-centric world economy. Over the course of the 19th century, these two circuits of circulation, one, a coastal Indian Ocean trading circuit, and the other, inland caravan trading, drew closer. To say that inland continental trade was subsumed by a global maritime trade is only part of the story. Lali describes accompanying processes such as declining pastoralism, canal colonization, changing land rights and labor regimes, and the creation of standing armies, all of which contributed to, de to declining caravan traffic. The late 19th century was also when the full impact of new technology and new infrastructure was felt. The arrival of the railroad in the Punjab in 1860 led to a sudden influx of cotton into the province, about three quarters of which was re-exported onto Afghanistan, Kashmir, and Greater Central Asia. Interestingly, as Lali also notes, a small-scale trade in locally spun cotton cloth continued in smaller centers, often escaping the attention of colonial officials. Besides deindustrialization in India, caravan trade also shrunk as the Indo-Afghan frontier became a space of trans-imperial rivalry and competition during the so-called Great Game. This was a global process. New forms of economic power and imperial rivalry, Lali argues, projected modern forms of power into the inner spaces of Eurasia, Africa, and the Americas. In light of the above comments, let me suggest three broad areas for discussion, conversation. Again, I want to underscore that these comments are informed by my own study of emerging spatial and economic configurations in Central Asia today, and my conversations with traders who move between Central Asia and China, North Pakistan and China. First, I continue to be curious about the individuals who made up the caravans. This is a broad category, as Lali describes, but I wonder how they themselves considered what they were doing. To again, underscore, emphasize my contemporary bias. When I ask this question of traders today, the answer invariably has to do with livelihood. While the answer might be iterated in different ways, lack of other job opportunities, survival, supporting family, aggrandizing profits, sometimes a boastful masculinity, at the core is money. Suggestions of Silk Roadism, directly or indirectly, are absent. Is it the same for people in caravans between India and Central Asia in the 18th and the 19th century? How would they describe what they were doing? Was it profit? And if so, how was it articulated? Or was it something more? Scaling up, I wonder if this is the story of localized proto-capitalism being subsumed within the global economy. 
as Saskia Sasen and other social scientists have noted, capitalist production and circulations transcend political boundaries, as indeed it does in Lali's narrative. By the end of the 18th century, India's coastal regions were already integrated within a global economy. Punjab and the Indo-Central Asian trading region, Lali suggests, were vestiges of an older Indo-centric world economy. By the end of the 18th century, India's coast, sorry. Um, I'm also struck by how information travels. Here I was reminded about knowledge of exchange rates, bills of exchange, extension of credit, and repatriation of money and profit, and how that was essential for the emergence of capitalism. So when we tell the story of this Silk Road, taking into account the accompanying transformations of the state, are we in fact telling the story of capitalism? My last comment is admittedly provocative and it pertains to the politics of using the term Silk Road. As I suggested in the beginning, I appreciated how Lali has disassociated the Silk Road from China since Bandung increasingly after the 1990s and more so since the Belt and Road Initiative has been unrolled, Silk Road has become a curated trope signaling either continental connectivity before European imperialism in Asia, or a new connectivity today by way of continental bridges and economic corridors. In both its pre-modern and contemporary iterations, one end of the Silk Road is anchored in China. Lali shifts the Silk Road away from its east-west orientation. Temporally, this book locates Silk Road alongside the history of high imperialism in Asia, which incidentally, as Tamara Chin and Valerie Hansen have demonstrated, is precisely when and where the idea of the Silk Road originated. But it still has me curious, why Silk Road, especially when people along the so-called Silk Road did not see it as such? Besides being shorthand for connectivity, what else does the term net us? Thank you very much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed the book and uh, sort of sort of hoping to sort of discuss some of these ideas next. Thank you. Ben, Jagjit, back to you. Thank you so much, Hassan, for those comments. Um, I um, thank you also for sending them to me in advance. So I had a, a little bit of time to think about them. Um, the three questions um, you posed, and let me take them uh, as best as I can in reverse order. Uh, the first is, uh, the first and most provocative, uh, is about the value of the Silk Road as a framing device. Of course, a cynic could say that it's to sell copies of books, um, but that can't possibly be the only reason. Uh, no, a more serious reason, as I try and indicate in the beginning and the end of the book, is that when most people think of trans-Eurasian trade or trade within the continental interior, they think of the Silk Roads, they think of movements of goods between China and Europe. And um, precisely the chronology that you mentioned, uh, a China-centric uh, set of terrestrial connections, which is ancient, and then a China-centric set of connections, which is more modern, is what most people have in mind. And what I want to show in this book, um, coming from a very different place, I suppose, coming from, uh, I'll get back to that. What I want to show in this book is that there is a, a period in the, around the early modern period, around the dawn of modernity, in which terrestrial connections don't cease to be important. They just cease to be perhaps the way we have understood them. They cease to have a particular geography, a particular uh, east-west latitudinal uh, spatiality. I mean, of course, you know, only so much scholarship exists out there which has said that the ancient Silk Roads weren't entirely terrestrial, there were maritime connections too, and you know, I'm not rejecting any of that in order to make my case. And, um, uh, really what I'm trying to do is to say that uh, by connecting to the concept of the Silk Roads, problematic though it is, I'm trying to say that terrestrial forms of connectivity are constantly changing. Um, they're changing uh, across the Eurasian continental interior, firstly, they're also changing within the space that I'm looking at, within the trading world. And one of the things I argue in the book is that the spatiality of caravan trade also changes. And I want to think with that rather than against it, to think with uh, the idea of um, terrestrial forms of connectivity, interlude circuits, and their kind of replasticization is one of the things I want to make. I should just say where I'm coming from. I mean, I'm coming from a very different place. I'm coming from a place where, uh, as a historian, you, when you do early modern global history, you're very much focused on maritime exchanges. They are, the sea is the vector of, of, uh, uh, of mobility. So the, I suppose the politics of it for me is not China, 
the politics of it for me is maritime history and trying to push back against only so much maritime history, uh, which really, in my opinion, is very Eurocentric still um, because it focuses on a set of uh, networks forged by uh, Europeans. Europeans sometimes collaborating with Asians and other groups, of course, but it's a um, yeah, it's a very particular set of imperial networks. Um, <laughs> and I think I'm trying to push back against that a little bit and, and to say that there is a whole other set of things happening, a whole other set of networks, and we should look at them too. Um, your second question is about whether one could read the book as a history of capitalism. And I would say yes, absolutely. And you should read it as a history of capitalism. Um, you know, in the, one, of the things that, one of the things I do in the book is I talk about multiple different globalizations, multiple modernities, so why not also think about multiple capitalisms, very much in the spirit of some of those um, scholars you mentioned. Um, and I should say that I teach a, a big 20-week course on Indian economic history from 1500 to the era of liberalization, and one of the weeks in our course is about merchant communities, and we look at exactly those scholars that you've, you've mentioned. Um, we look at different Indian merchant communities, Marawaris, <laughs> Um, Multanis, Parsis, um, we look at Chetias and so on. And one of the things that my students think about, my best students think about, is not only the difference between indigenous and imperial Western forms of, of capital and exchange networks, but also the difference between different Indian merchant communities and networks, the different kinds of exchange that one sees within these networks, um, the different uh, business organization, the different ways of doing business, the different kind of um, operational structures. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a very rich set of questions. I mean, this this topic sort of fell out of fashion, really. Um, and mm -hmm. hopefully one of the things that my book can do is maybe, um, maybe bring a little bit of interest back to those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, not to get too big headed, but I, I definitely think that is something that um, may not have been an explicit ambition when I started writing the book, but um, I think is something that we should think with. And of course, I can put my book on, the, on, my, on my reading list now, and my students can read it, and they can uh, think with it too. And then the final um, point is uh, about actors' own understandings of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and this, I should say, is something which is interesting, and I have even less of an answer to this, uh, this question. Um, those of you who do go on to read the book, one of the things that will become apparent is that we have very little direct, unmediated access to the testimony of many of the actors that I'm interested in. We just don't know things in their words. I mean, I do start one of the final chapters with a sort of um, dialogue between some Afghan merchants and a, a colonial official, and that is from a transcript that I found in the archives. But that is a transcript as produced by the colonial official. It's very, very strongly mediated and, and sort of produced for the purposes of record keeping. So it's really difficult to get at this um, empirically. I would say also, I have my doubts about the methodological possibilities of, of answering your question. I mean, I have always had doubts about, um, you know, when when someone is, someone, the records attest says that they're performing norkery they're performing military service i really have in, i really wonder what the um the knocker the the military serviceman what he thinks of as norkery compared to his patron right so given that we know what he's doing from sources written by the patron or the or writers for the patron i i wonder whether even in those areas of um employment shall we call them in south asia in the pre-modern period where we do know something about what people think they're doing um, or how they see themselves do we really know how we see them or how they see themselves and, and i think it's actually very difficult to get at those um, kinds of questions um and, and another example that comes immediately to my mind is the colonial census and the way in which lower evaluated castes use the census as a way to self-fashion new uh, upwardly mobile identities for themselves. So, um, you know, again, how does someone describe themselves is not uh, without slippages and problems. Um, so uh, that's a very devious way of answering your question, which is to say that I think it's empirically and methodologically very difficult to answer, but it is a very good, uh, you know, it's a thorn, I suppose, um, and something that I've been thinking about for a long time and, and have never got any closer to answering. 
Um, those are all very good questions. And hopefully, um, and thank you very much, Hassan, again, for engaging with the book, for reading the book, and for posing those, um, those comments and questions, which I hope other people will take up um, as they read the book and maybe uh, optimistically, perhaps, I think maybe it'll inspire them, even if they're very critical and think that what I've said is absolute nonsense, but maybe it will inspire um, new avenues in research and new inquiries. Um, but yeah, hopefully we also have other questions that perhaps I can answer a little better than I just did. Well, excellent. I think we've got a, a real uh, palpable sense about the book. Um, before we turn to the audience, uh, I just would remind everybody to please put your questions in the Q&A box, which is on the lower right hand side of your screen. We have a couple there uh, from audience members. Please include some identifying um, uh, material so we know who you are and I will uh, integrate those into our discussion. But before I, I uh, move to those questions, um, I'm going to abuse my position as chair just to actually expand upon some of the things that both Jagjit and Hassan said. And I think um, Looking over my own notes about the work, one of the things uh, that I was always struck by with your work, Jagjit, is the um, intellectual generosity of spirit that the work is marked by. Uh, you know, you, you've both called out a number of scholars that we could add many, many more, and you, your your bibliography and your notes add many, many more. And on the one hand, um, that indicates a, a kind of I don't want to say synthetic work, but a work that is very much engaged with the historiography and the discussion going on with other scholars. Juxtapose that with exactly what you were just talking about, the richness of your archival research. And I think that really does point to really one of the, the elements of this book that makes it such a rare gem. On the one hand, the sophisticated and advancing discussion you have with the historiography that really um, you, you uh, engage it and you meaningfully carry it forward. And on the other hand, how you do that with adding new materials um, and, and bringing a level of detail that is distinct from anything else that's been out there. So I really applaud you for that because it is, uh, I know I keep saying this, but it's a magisterial work. It has an enormous amount of ambition, but its execution equals its ambition, which I think is such uh, an incredible thing for any scholar to do, much less a scholar of uh, relative youth as yourself. So congratulations on what is a fantastic uh, piece of scholarship. With that said, uh, let me integrate our uh, some of our questions out of the Q&A. And this is from a recent master's graduate from uh, George Washington from the Elliott School, Charlemagne uh, McAfee, who's a Chinese language fellow. And uh, Charlemagne asked, to what extent can the lessons of the book be generalized to tell us about the role of trade in building hard power and empires elsewhere in the world? Obviously, this is echoing some of the discussion you and Hassan have engaged with uh, a global history of capitalism, um, but uh, if you can go ahead and perhaps expand on that. That's a really, um, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and actually one which uh, perhaps I can try and answer with some China, um, China tidbits of, uh, that I happen to know. Um, and actually I want to answer it by flipping it on its head, because one of the arguments I make in the book is that trade networks, the networks of caravan trade, transformed, reconfigured, replasticized, though they are, are much more durable than some of the states and empires that we normally fixate on. So in the period that which I'm, I'm studying, the Mughal Empire, the Afghan Empire, the Sikh Empire, the British Empire sort of come and go. These networks of trade endure. Um, some communities, their fortunes rise and fall. One of the things I show in the book is that there are some new mercantile um, actors, some new commercial groups who arise to the forefront of the trade. One of the chapters I'm most proud of um, is chap the chapter on traders, where I try to recover the role of Afghan merchants who aren't, in my opinion, simply um, carriers of trade or, or peddlers. One of the things I try and show in that chapter is that all across Eurasia, as a result of the influx of bullion 
from the seaboards into the interiors. This is the time when the Afghan empire is looting North India and carrying wealth back into the into this interior space, when the Russian empire is expanding into the interior, when the Qing empire, again, enriched by trade, um, is also moving to the, to the West. There is this great influx of liquidity and that creates all kinds of new uh, commercial opportunities for different merchant groups. And we see the rise of new Muslim merchant groups in uh, the Indo-Central Asian trading world. We see new Muslim merchant groups, some of whom had no commercial backgrounds before in um, uh, the Russian Empire, so the, a different part of the continental interior, and also in Western China. Um, so there is, some, there is change, but uh, that's just to kind of plug a bit of the book there. Um, but these trade networks are really important, they're really durable. And one of the things I also argue in another chapter is that um, traders support and um, try and, well, traders have a role as kingmakers, right? Um, they can, uh, and this again flows with the, into the, the kind of um, set of ideas uh, articulated much better much more fulsomely by someone like Munis Faruqi in his book on, on princes in the Mughal Empire about the need to build up princely households and that involves creating relationships with bankers and financiers in order to win wars of succession. So traders, merchants, the magnate groups are very closely connected to political power. They have the ability and an interest in supporting, backing particular um, uh, candidates for uh, a throne or a, a seat of political power. And yet, despite that, despite the durability of trade networks, despite their role in um, political change and in dynastic change, regnal change, we tend to focus on states and empires. And one of the arguments I try to make in the book is that actually maybe we need to we need to shift our focus from states and empires to trade networks. And to go back to your question, I mean, we know in the, in the case of the Qing ascendants, the relationship between the Qing and um, merchant communities. Um, people who are engaging in cross-border trade, um, the relationship between the Qing and um, Europeans, Portuguese uh, who have uh, firearms, for example. So I think that um, there is a larger story to tell, but rather than necessarily wanting to try and use, to try and tell the story of, of empires, um, perhaps we can maybe shift the focus all the way around and try and tell the story of trade network, uh, of, of um, a capital of uh, mercantile power. Can I follow up on that with a, uh, a question of my own based on what you were talking about, a kind of history of trade networks, which I think that there's an expanding body of, of literature on um, some of it more contemporary, as Hassan well knows, uh, and, and working backwards. You know, one of the critiques about the focus on empires and states is that it um, it magnifies state power and authority and gives a sense of uh, state presence, which is out of all proportion to the lived reality historically, right? That states, we all know, and empires were at best peripatetic. They were episodic and, and usually marked by their absence rather than presence. Yet, we have this archive that gives us this kind of attempted panoptical view. So in reconstructing a history that is based on trading networks rather than state power, how do we avoid that pitfall and replicating it? Because your work does such a wonderful job really giving both a depth but also breadth to these trading networks and their continuity and change over time. And yet at the same time, I'll never forget a conversation I had with Magnus Marston, who you uh, uh, mentioned in this book. And uh, he and I have worked up in the Wakhan corridor and we were doing some research in Ishkashim, which you know is one of the centers of the Silk Road uh, through the Wakhan corridor. And at one point I remember Magnus looking at me and saying, you do realize this is the back end of beyond. <laughs> you know, like there are actually, for as much as we create the, the this, as it were, sensibility of connectivity, um, especially in the early modern world, you know, the kafilas and the caravan traders are marked by their absence rather than their presence. So how do we balance that as it were? 
Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm just just to play with what you just said, which is that you know the caravans are marked by the absence, and you know you earlier said that states are also marked by the absence. Well, I suppose then um, it would be in, in, it would be improper to focus too much on these networks um, because one would repeat the same kinds of mistakes one makes when one thinks about states and empires. And maybe one of the things that I usefully do in the book is to look at the world created by caravan trade. So to look at the network, the kind of geography, the routes, the nodes, the, the kind of itinerary, the circuits, but also look at the world in which it's embedded. So, you know, in chapter three, for example, on exchanges, I look at how things move from the countryside to some of these nodes. Um, so I'm not just producing the trade network that is produced by a particular merchant, but the various different um, capillary-like networks into which it's interleaved. And I think maybe what that usually does, someone once described that chapter as quite ethnographic, and I suppose it is because what it's trying to look at is the ethnography of commerce in this particular space, and to balance and give as much attention to uh, a peasant who is selling his goods to a broker as a, a, you know, a merchant money lender, a trader financier who is moving things from somewhere like Multan to somewhere like Bukhara, and also peddlers who might take goods bought from a market like a marketplace in Kabul into the highlands. And to give those, to give each of those space, um, because they are all part of the larger trading world, they are all. Um, I suppose they're all important and one can't understand the trade network and caravan trade without understanding those other ones. Um, there's other, there's other, there's other um, uh, sets of exchanges and uh, networks and relationships. And one also sees different aspects of the state then. Uh, one sees the, how caravan trade is connected to the routine business of tax collection of the standing crop, uh, as well as transit duties. Um, and this is another way, you know, one of the ways I'm trying to say that, uh, you know, you may not see caravan trade, it has an absence, but it has a great significance to the political economy of these states. And, you know, the book is really trying to say, yeah, you may not be able to see it, you may not have that much information on it, but it is integral to these, these states. And we need to recover that and understand um, A different aspect of state power, a different set of political, a different kind of political economy, um, a different dimension, therefore, to the, the colonial transition. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but that, that's a great answer because uh, to go back to Hassan's question about uh, what do the traders themselves think, that's wonderful that you bring out that what I would agree is really an ethnographic chapter that tries to reconstruct. Um, as best one can with the methodological limitations, uh, the effects on these different actors within the system. And I would wholly uh, echo and agree with what you just said about even though the, the caravans themselves might, might be absent, they, they, they have this kind of ripple effect through the system. And as that collapses, as you document in your own work in this book through the 19th and into the 20th century, that has ramifications for not only the political economy, but political stability throughout this region. Um, and uh, I mean, that's really one of the, the things that you so clearly bring out. Um, we've got another question actually from a PhD student in political science from, from Canada, who's studying China's uh, BRI's impact on India, both domestically and internationally. Um, and it's a more contemporary question, so I think both you and Hassan could, could have a go at this because I think it's quite interesting. Um, the question is uh, about how the Silk Road in India is impacting the neighboring region politically. Uh, perhaps, Hassan, you can talk about more contemporary and Jagjit, you could uh, expand uh, historically. Um, and uh, a corollary to that is what is the current um, discourse in India about the historical Silk Road's effects on India's rejection of the BRI.
Hassan, you're muted. <laughs> no, Jajit, I was, uh, would you like to go first? Um, sure. Um, I don't have a huge amount to say. Um, I can add that when I, when the review reports for the book came in, um, I was told to add something about um, India's engagement with, uh, but this is something I don't know anything about really, um, I should confess. And I learned something from the, re the review reports that India is trying to produce its own counter to the Belt and Road Initiative um, uh, in sort of circumventing pa Pakistan is sort of cut out of this and trying to create a maritime link to Iran and then through uh, overland through those ways. So I think there is um, uh, the Silk Road of, uh, as uh, Peter Frankman said, are, you know, they're, they're alive and kicking, um, but there are multiple Silk Roads and it, it is very much like the, what I argue in the book that routes are competitive. Um, there is competition for, to move things through different routes. Political authorities are aware of the fact that merchants can move things in different directions and they try to support the movement of goods through their particular territory um, in order to capture the benefits from it. I mean, that's about as much as I can say about that um, without, yeah, I, I leave it to Hassan. Perhaps. So yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, sort of in, 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 in brief, I mean, I think that sort of, uh, sort of, you know, if, 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 if one were to compare China and India and China and Pakistan, what we would find is that um, generally speaking, there's a political wariness in India, at least as I understand it, vis-a-vis uh, -vis BRI and what that means for new configurations of, of, of economic power, strategic power in Asia. Um, but having said that, I'm also struck by the fact that the language of diplomacy, uh, especially um, sort of the, the the degree of fraternity that uh, sort of one sees being evoked between China and India is really quite remarkable. I mean, so, sort of both of these states, when they discuss the role of the other in Asia, they talk, they talk in grand historical terms. They talk about how India and China are these ancient civilizations uh, in Asia. So I guess what I'm getting at is that even though we're seeing a fair amount of caution on the part of India in terms of what BRI might mean for the projection of Chinese power in Asia, at the same time, I'm also struck by the fact that in diplomatic exchanges, uh, one comes across these references to both of the countries being ancient civilizations. And that makes me think that for China, uh, India is actually very important. So I mean, I, 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 you know, I think it's 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 perhaps possible to look beyond the differences, to look beyond the border disputes, to a point in the future where these two countries might actually find themselves uh, on the same page as far as a number of issues are concerned. Um, once again, very briefly, uh, sort of. China Pakistan relations are, of course, extremely close. Uh, it's seen to be a model of connectivity and cooperation under BRI. Um, sort of one sort of issue over there, as far as India Pakistan bilateral relations are concerned, is that the so called economic corridor uh, passes through the Karakoram region, Gilgit Baltistan, which is part of historic Kashmir. Uh, and that's a, that's a disputed region. So that just sort of amplifies um, the, the, the sort of um, the Kashmir dispute in the way in which it, 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 it currently plays out. But it's a big question and it's got, it's got, it's got a number of layers to it. Well, and Jagjit, in, in your defense, I think you sell yourself a little bit short in the sense that um, your history presented here is in many ways a destabilizing one in its sophistication. Because, uh, you know, as we've talked about here so far, that there are certain kind of romanticized notions of what the Silk Road is, obviously China taking quite a place. But even, you know, within South Asia, when we talk about um, the Silk Road from South Asia or trade in into Inner Asia from South Asia, there's a focus um, in particular on Indian merchant groups, right? You know, the Shikapuri and the Multani bankers, et cetera, et cetera, the Mawawis and, and we, we've already mentioned. But one of the things that your book does, which is so interesting, is it does recover um, 
the agency and the positionality of Afghan traders, right? Afghans, especially mm -hmm. Pakistanis, are so often just viewed as something problematic to get through. You have to get through the Gomel and you have to get through um, uh, the Khyber. Um, but other people do that. Maybe there's the Pawindas that you might pay off to get your goods from point A to point B. But otherwise, these are not really actors in this economic circuit or only peripheral actors. And yet you recenter them in a really fundamental way that I think you could see um, that being highly problematic for the creation of a historical memory of the Silk Road for the BJP, right? In the sense that you say, wait a minute, it's not just a bunch of Hindu merchants from Multan and Shikapur that are going up to Nishni Novgorod. It's actually a bunch of traders that go from the Punjab um, and from, from the Sikh empire all the way through the Afghan lands who create this in one way cosmopolitan space um, that is much more integrated than perhaps some of the previous scholarship, not necessarily intentionally has given an impression of, but has given us a distinct impression of. So I, I think you actually have more to say um, than you give yourself credit for in that. I just had actually one thing. I was just reading back the question and I had one thing which came to my mind about the impact of India's trade and on other regions and other states. And, and one of the things, and here, I, this is not really my work per se, although I did look at primary source material, which says this, and it was really first uncovered, I suppose, by Scott Levi, who showed that um, the particular problems that Russia had with Indian merchants, um, Russia wanted to monopolize trade with Central Asia, Indians are British subjects, aggressing Indian merchants would therefore uh, aggress uh, Britain, and that wasn't desired. So it had to find other ways of um, uh, of pushing out Indian merchants from Central Asia. And, and that's one of the things I talk about elsewhere in the book. So one can also see those kinds of political conflicts uh, playing out in subtle ways, um, uh, uh, always with the potential of escalating, um, but not quite escalating. I see there are more questions coming, so I'll stop. There are indeed, uh, unsurprisingly, this has gotten quite a bit of attention from our audience members. Um, I, I, I need to give a shout out to one of my former students who's asked a question by Bob Jane, who himself is currently in Delhi. Um, and his question for you, Jagjit, is could you juxtapose China's pre-medieval and medieval Silk Road across Central Asia with India's organic trading networks and diaspora that emerged in Africa in the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, in what ways did they differ and compare? I may have to pass on that question because I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure it's um, this is my own ignorance. I'm not sure what the um, the net India's networks in Africa that are being referred to here are. So I, I don't. No, if I can answer. Maybe you can enlighten me then. Uh, well, I'm just trying to think how, how to rephrase it. Um, what well, you've already talked about the, the focus on the maritime trade in the early modern period and how that dislocates our terrestrial uh, or our, our focus on the terrestrial trade. And it seems that becomes supercharged with the Pax Britannica. There's so much on the Indian Ocean world that's come out lately. And actually, that's one of the nice things about your work is it stands not in contrast or conflict with that scholarship, but really complementing it and, and calling us to uh, remember that as this Pax Britannica, this Indian Ocean moment matures through the course of the 19th century and in the 21st century re-engages our, our scholarly attention, that we cannot move our eye from the terrestrial economy that continues not subordinated, not in place of, but in many ways complementary. And so I guess if I was to, and forgive me by Bob, I'm gonna do this, but if I was to, to re, uh, rephrase that question, maybe you could um, talk about how those terrestrial and maritime worlds come to interact as we move forward in time in your work, because you do address that in the book. Yeah, and actually here, I mean, just to um, broach some comparison with Africa, I mean, here I should really um, 
refer to some comparisons I try to make uh, in the book here and there. Um, building on, uh, inspired by the work of Guy Denidon and her work on trans-Saharan trade. And, you know, she very much looks also um, in a very long and sophisticated book about the history of trans-Saharan trade in the 19th and 20th yeah, in the 19th century, long 19th century, and then in the organization, the, the sort of uh, structural organization of that trade is, is what she looks at in the second half of the book. And she, you know, also one of the claims that she makes is, and I'm very sympathetic to this, and I think I make a similar one, is that um, these uh, commercial circuits and networks are not divorced from those which are seaward and maritime already in the early modern period, as Europeans are bringing goods to the African coast, some of those goods are finding their way into these trans-Saharan networks. So it's not like there's this sudden injection of um, goods from the West in the era of the new imperialism when European powers move more deeply into the interior. And I think I try and show something similar, which is that liquidity, perhaps, if not actual goods, but maybe also some goods, are moving into the circuits that are, are primarily oriented towards the continental interior, are coming from them from this maritime facing world. And so they are separate, or it's analytically useful to think of them as separate. In some ways they are separate, but they are interleaved. Um, uh, and that the, the one is not um, uh, immune to changes uh, and flows in the other. And then what I try and show in the book and what Yen Lino also shows in her work is that, you know, over the 19th century, there is a deepening of European um, involvement, uh, informal and formal empire, uh, eventually towards the second, the latter half of the century. There is more um, European involvement in Africa, and that does create economic opportunities. There are new goods, which people may actually want in the interior, and so merchants do take them into the interior. But there's also competition um, that creates competition that also creates new economies that redirect um, uh, the locus of prosperity, places of employment away from the interior. And people do move to, for example, more uh, coastal regions. And I think I try and show something similar in my book. So um, I think there are parallels with other parts of the world. And there are certainly, we see something similar, a changing pattern of interaction um, in, in many other locales. And I wonder, I, and I'd like to know what an Africanist thinks of this and whether this is similar or different to places that they work on too. I have a question of my own interest that I'd like to ask both you, but also get Hassan in, involved in. And that is something that I think is implicit in the book and that has been mentioned in passing in our discussion today um, and will probably not surprise you given my own interest, but you know, many of the places that you look at are, um, for lack of a better term, frontiers or mm. borderlands. Mm. They're definitely peripheries to a global economic, but also regional economic system. And I think you do make an implicit argument. Um, number one, collapsing this idea of a center periphery conversation by, by talking about, hey, let's think about this in a different way. Um, but you also engage these spaces uh, uh, in a very creative way. And I just wonder uh, very broadly, you know, there is a, a distinct um, set of historiography that's emerged in the past two decades about uh, borderlands, about frontiers, about these peripheral spaces. And I wonder, do you see your work um, speaking to that historiography in any way, aging in that, that historiography? And what conversation do you see there with that? And to bring Hassan into this, because Hassan, you you focusing up on Gilgit and Baltistan and the uh, Karakoram, um, you know, maybe we can also uh, think about how um, the modern focus on borders is both sites of opportunity, but also disjuncture may inform uh, our conversation, but also be reflected in your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I should just say that um, the weather here in London is a bit tropical. Um, we have sun and warmth in the morning, and around about the time of the afternoon, it, there's torrential rain and thunder. So um, that was what you may have just heard, and there may be more coming. Yesterday, we also had hailstones, so it was quite biblical. 
Um, and so apologies if I also missed part of your question. I mean, what I suppose came to my mind, and again, this isn't really an answer, um, but a suggestion is um, um, frontiers or borderlands for whom? And I think one of the things I want to think about, and I try to think about, and you're right, it's implicit, and it's also implicit in other parts of my work, is um, the idea of um, different zones of civility, how some of the places that, say, the British come to call a frontier space um, might not be called a frontier by um, an indigenous political authority, but might be seen as outside of a zone of civility because it's a different kind of terrain, a different kind of life way. And does it is it useful if one's thinking in um, the long durée, if one's thinking across historical epochs, to think of it as a frontier, therefore? And actually, might we need to do more research into how people conceive of particular kinds of space in the past? In turn, might that be really useful for this work on borderlands and frontiers to maybe kind of break down some of the work on borderlands and frontiers and to try and think more about something which is in the literature, right? The idea that borderlands and frontiers are constructed spaces, they're places of the imagination, they're imagined spaces, and yet this imaginary has produced such a large scholarship. This is no disrespect to Ben, who's produced a wonderful book, uh, which my students really love. Um, but it is peculiar and perverse that something which is understood to be a, a figment, well, not quite a figment, but part of the colonial imagination then produces a scholarship about the colonial imagination of this space. And actually, maybe we need to destabilize that by looking, by thinking across historical time at the ways, in, the multiple ways in which these kinds of spaces are seen. And I don't have answers to that. I have speculative thoughts. Um, uh, I think what this really calls for, though, is cooperation between, and, and this is again, one, you know, to bring this back to the book, one of the things that the book tries to do, and hopefully, even if people don't like the contents of the book, hopefully maybe they may um, believe in the, the project of thinking across the post, the, the pre-colonial and colonial divides, right, just to think, hmm. you know, I think if our British imperial colleagues did more work with our early modern South Asia colleagues, we might think in new ways about some of these, these kinds of questions and problems. Um, and I think one of the things that maybe this book calls for and is for that kind of thinking across these e historical epochs and a different kind of interdisciplinarity, not of, of subject matter necessarily or disciplinary method, um, but of, you know, bringing the imperial and the and the, the Mughal together, for example, um, might be very productive. I don't know why people are so reluctant to do this. I'm not, I'm not sure why, but um, uh, on both sides, I think. It's my kind of suggestion, also. Hassan, would you like to yeah, yeah, just just very, very briefly. I mean, I think sort of one of the things that, that uh, sort of uh, the, the book illustrates very well is how a region uh, sort of like the Punjab, uh, which in the 19th century sort of uh, is, is seen as a frontier, uh, is then brought within the ambit of the modern state and 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 sort of to to fast forward to the contemporary moment, uh, you know, one would one would never imagine the Punjab as any sort of frontier region right now. I think, you know, just conveying that to uh, perhaps someone who are not very well versed with the history of the region would be would be quite a challenge. And I think the inverse is true for a region like uh, Gilgit Baltistan. I mean, sort of, you know, going back to the late 19th century before it becomes the Gilgit agency. I don't really get the sense that it's any frontier, but then it's it's peripheralized uh, as a result of its incorporation uh, sort of in an imperial polity, and then that peripheralization continues after 1947. So, in fact, you know, one could say that it's more of a frontier in the 21st century. Uh, you know, sort of taking frontier to be synonymous with peripheralization, very very simply put, it's more of a frontier now than it was perhaps in the middle of the 19th century. You know, the lovely thing about both of your answers um, is that it actually reminds me, or I think highlights two other frontiers that we haven't talked about in the book. One that you just gave such an eloquent exposition about is temporal frontiers and the need for us to uh, think about how to challenge and collapse them. Um, the other one that you do explicitly 
evoke in the book, though not necessarily as frontiers, are um, ecological ones. I mean, you, you talk very dis uh, very clearly about um, how these caravans move from one ecological zone to another in a way that actually reminded me of uh, Yas Goman's work about um, uh, uh, Mughal India and its different ecological zones. I'm cognizant that we're just about out of time, and it would be remiss of me to let you go, Jagji, without asking what is next. We have such a fantastic work here that I know I myself, but I'm sure everybody listening wants to know when the next volume is due and what it's going to be so we can pre-order it on Amazon. Uh, well, the next volume is called India in the Early Modern World, and it's meant to be out in 2022, but that may, <laughs> no, it's, meant, it's due to the publish in 2022. That may now need to be revised in light of um, the past year. Uh, you know, I, this is a kind of strange moment um, because I thought I was going to work on the Himalayas next, and I would love to work on it, but there's so many new scholars doing really great and interesting stuff. I kind of think that they should work on the Himalaya and some of these upland places that I've been interested in for a long time, and I should leave it to them and um, maybe maybe take stock in a couple of years' time. But so I was ready to kind of put some of my archival notes on aside, including notes from fieldwork in Burma, some of which, um, some of the material has come out. And then, of course, um, we all know what's been happening in Myanmar over the last um, few months. And so I now feel a kind of responsibility to return to some of my field notes uh, and maybe produce a little bit more on the impulse. So expect to see two very different sets of things from me. Um, some stuff about late 19th and early 20th century in Myanmar, um, smuggling, road building, uh, all kinds of things. And then a, a book about uh, the early modern world, uh, India's place in the early modern world. So that's what's next. Fingers crossed. Well, I think I speak for everyone when I say we're excited to see that work. Um, and I can see already in the participants list some people that I know will be very keen uh, to read it. So, um, excellent. Well, Jagji, thank you so much for sharing your time and thoughts with us. Uh, again, everyone, um, as a reminder, it's India and the Silk Roads, uh, the history of the trading world. Um, in your chat, we have the discount code, uh, which I'm just pulling it up to remind you. I think it's Silk Road 25. Um, so, um, Jagjeet just told me at the beginning of this that his birthday is coming up in July. So, perhaps a good birthday present for Jagjeet would be, um, as myself, purchasing multiple copies to give to your friends, your family, uh, your students, your colleagues, uh, your dog. Anybody, uh, because I think we all actually would uh, would really benefit from what is a fantastic piece of scholarship. Uh, Hassan, thank you so much for your uh, uh, enlightening comments about Jagjik's work. Um, it's just been a pleasure to speak with both of you today. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. It's it's a really nice it's a really nice grouping of people um, across uh, the world, uh, Pakistan, the United States, and and uh, England, and uh, people two of you didn't know each other before, and so it's been really uh, productive, I hope, and uh, a real honor to have been able to take this spot, the the May book spot. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, Jagjit, congratulations! It's a it's a it's a terrific work. I I really really enjoyed it. Thank yep. you very much. So just a reminder to everyone, uh, as Jagjit just said, this is our May New Books in Asian Studies. Uh, we will be having a, a June one. The date is yet to be determined, but do watch this space proverbially uh, as we'll be getting that announcement out soon. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening for you. It's been a pleasure to, to hear about Jagjit's work, and we look forward to welcoming you to our next New Books in Asian Studies. Stay well.